Hello everyone and welcome to a quick tutorial on how to use Unity's new input system. In this episode, we will make a very basic cross-platform player controller script that supports both gamepad and keyboard plus mouse inputs. So in this video, we'll examine why this new system, introduced in Unity 2019.2, is a great way to set up modular and efficient player inputs, thanks to special, easy-to-tweak assets. And by the way, don't forget that if you want to check out the tutorial files directly, you can have a look at the GitHub repo with all my Unity tutorials over here. Alright, and with that said, let's get into it and see how to make our cross-platform player controller system. Unity's new input system relies on a few core objects that are essential to understand if you want to dive deeper into this. The input actions asset, the action maps, and the bindings. The input actions are stored as an asset in your project. They are the top-level object that you'll need to instantiate and refer to in order to access the input system. This asset then contains one or more action maps. Those maps define all the mappings between a key, or a gamepad input, and an action in a given context. This is super useful if you want your controls to perform different actions depending on the situation your player is currently in. For example, in the UI of the menu, in the 3D world on the ground, flying with a parachute, etc. Finally, each action map contains one or more binding. A binding is an action that can be listened to and reacted to in your c -sharp script. It will be activated and emitted by the input system if the matching button or joystick is used. The nice thing is that this binding can contain a list of device inputs and keys to directly handle cross-platform disambiguation. All in all, although it's a bit complex to apprehend at first, the new input system is pretty powerful, and it particularly shines in three areas. First, it makes cross-platform controls easy. Compared to the old input system, it is way faster to set up something to perform the same action via your keyboard, an Xbox controller, a PlayStation gamepad, etc. And it also makes it really easy to keep all devices consistent and in sync. Second, there are lots of quick wins and facilitators, like binding compositing, setting the input by pressing it on your controller, switching between multiple action maps depending on the current context, and more. And third, the system can work thanks to events. This makes it more optimized for discrete inputs because you don't need to continuously pull and check for them in your update function. Instead, you define callbacks that are managed on their own, automatically, if the input is indeed activated. So even though it takes a bit more preliminary work and it requires you to really focus at first, the new input system actually does a lot of the heavy lifting under the hood, and ultimately it creates a more robust architecture, in particular because it uses actions. Now, I've said that before, that this new system relies on bindings to properly map player inputs to actions, but you might be wondering, why is that a valuable technique? Why can't we just say, if I press the spacebar, then the player jumps? It would be way more readable, right? Well, it's true that the most basic form of input is one that directly maps a specific piece of hardware, like a button or an axis value, to a function in the game. The problem with that method is that it completely depends on the device you use, and it's pretty hard to reconfigure afterwards. If you want to handle another type of input controller, you'll have to add another check in your if statements. And if the player wants to remap the controls to better suit their style, it's simply impossible. That's why usually you don't do direct binding like this, but rather you add an intermediary component, the action. The idea is that instead of referencing a specific device button or an axis, you see that your function will be triggered by an event that corresponds to an action. This action is purely abstract. The important thing is that it can be caused by one or more inputs and that these inputs can change throughout the game, without this change impacting the action events function part of the chain. So having an input logic with actions is way more flexible than direct bindings, and that's why it's at the heart of Unity's new input system. But alright, enough talking, let's see how to install and set up the package to actually create some inputs. Okay, first of all, to use the new input system, remember that you'll need to have Unity's 2019.2 version or newer, so make sure you have the right editor version. 
Then you'll have to import the Unity input package in your project, cause it's still a downloadable lib for now. So go to your package manager and in the Unity registry install the input system package. Once it is done installing, Unity should warn you about needing to switch to the new system. Basically, to facilitate the transition and avoid too many breaking changes, Unity's team has decided to let devs have both systems coexist or pick just a single one. So you can click yes right now, or you can also click no and set this option in your project settings panel in the player section. To benefit from the new system, you can choose either the input system package new option or both. If you choose both, then the old system will continue to work as well. This can be very sweet if you have other packages that do rely on the old input system. Like in my case, Cinemachine, for example, that allows me to track and follow my player with ease. So here I'll choose both, and then I reload my project. Okay, so the first step before we can get to coding is to create our famous input actions asset, and the maps and the bindings that are inside. To do this, there are two possibilities. You can either create a brand new asset from scratch, or use a default one with some pre-configured maps and bindings. If you want to go the long way around, right-click in your project folder and create a new asset of input actions type from the context menu. But here I'll rather use and adapt the default one, cause we're gonna design some pretty common schemes, thus the default will already be mostly okay for us. So let's first create a new empty game object that I'll call the input manager, and then on it we're gonna add a new player input component. This component will handle all the input processing and the callback triggering for a single player game. Note that if you need multiple controllers at once, because you're working on a multiplayer thing, then you'll have to dig into the player input manager instead. That's a really nice feature that you can check out with the sample example scenes if you're interested, that enables you to quickly do lobbies, split screens, and this sort of thing. Now, in our player input component, we can click on the Create Actions button. This will prompt a pop-up that lets us choose where we want to store the asset, and automatically create a new input actions asset with some bindings in it. To actually inspect and edit this asset, we can simply double-click on it in the project folder, which will bring up the following panel, that you can dock anywhere in your layout like the other panels. Now in here we see our default input actions. So we already have a player and a UI action map in the left column, but in this tutorial we're actually gonna ignore the UI map and just focus on the player action map. Now, in this map, as you can see, we have three bindings already defined, move, look, and fire. Inside of each binding, you see the associated inputs per device type, like the keyboard or the gamepad. The move action also shows you an example of composite bindings. Here, the keyboard W, ASD, or arrow keys are treated as if they were gamepad sticks, only we clamp the values to the four up, right, down, left axes. So with just a single action and a simple binding, we actually get four possible values. Of course, in our case, we won't be needing the fire action, so we'll replace it with our jump action. The other two actions, move and look, on the other hand, can be used almost directly. But let's take a closer look at our bindings, and in particular discuss the types. You see that the move and look are both actions of value type, whereas the fire action, which we will rename to jump shortly, is a button action. In short, the new input system provides us with three action types. We have value actions for inputs that need to be tracked continuously and that require disambiguation, typically used for sticks or keyboard arrows. Then we have button actions for discrete inputs that are pressed, released, and held. And finally, we have pass-through actions, that are similar to value actions, but they bypass the disambiguation process, which allows you to get and consume inputs from all controls at once if need be. So in our case, we can keep the types as is, but we do need to take care of our jump action. So here, I'll double-click the fire action and rename it to jump, and then I'll click on the various device inputs and change them to something more intuitive like the spacebar key for the keyboard and the south button of the gamepad. 
Finally, it's really important that you remember to save your modifications by clicking the Save button at the top of the Editor panel. You can also enable the Auto Save mode, but because the package is still in dev, this can cause some slight UI issues. Anyway, at this point, we're almost done setting up our inputs. The last thing we have to do before we can start coding is use these assets to create a C-sharp class that wraps these input actions and makes them easier to access and to use in our code. Basically, it will avoid us having to remember that our input is in the player map and that it's named move. Instead, we'll have a class that gives our ID an autocomplete hint and that validates the path to the binding route is valid. Luckily, doing this is straightforward. We'll just select our input actions assets and in the inspector, toggle the Generate C# class checkbox. You can change the asset path, the name and the namespace of the class if you want, or you can just leave the defaults like here. Finally, click on the Apply button at the bottom and the new C# class will be added to your project. If you keep the default, the name of this class will depend on the name of your input actions asset, so in my case it's default player actions. Alright, we are now all set up and ready to use those actions in our code and make our little character move around. In this tutorial, I'm going to stick with the primitive for my player and use a little red sphere. I'll put it in a simple scene that has a ground plane, four walls and a few cubes so that I can move around and test collisions. All the objects in the scene, the ground, the walls and the cubes have colliders, either box colliders or mesh colliders, so that they are collisions with the player. My goal will be to use the left stick on a gamepad or the WASD arrow keys on a keyboard to move the character around, using a rigid body and physics-based movement scheme. And we'll also make sure that the south button or the spacebar makes us jump. All of this will be handled by a hero controller class. So let's create a new C-Shop script for this and add it as a new component on the hero object. Then we'll open it in the IDE and remove the auto-generated start and update functions. Cause instead, the first step here is to create and get a reference to our input actions. The idea here is to instantiate the default player actions class we've just generated to have a unique input manager instance. We can create it in our awake function by using the c -sharp class constructor like this. Now we can access the different bindings inside this input actions instance and enable or disable them in the onEnable and onDisable methods that are available to us since we inherit from MonoBehavior. And you see that thanks to the auto-generated class, we can easily access the various bindings with things like .player.move, which is really handy. So with this code, I've made it so that when my player is enabled or is disabled in the scene, I activate or deactivate its different input actions. But of course, we'll want these actions to actually do something when we press the corresponding inputs, so we need to link them to some callback functions. For the move and loop bindings, since they're continuous, we'll actually use polling in our update loop, like with the old system. Here I'll use fixed update instead of update to be sure all physics are computed properly, but it's the same idea. So we need to cache references to those actions in our hero controller class so that we can reuse them in the update loop and use their read value method to get their current value. Note that we need to import the unity engine.input system package to be able to use the input action variable type. For the jump binding, we can directly set a callback function on jump to be called when the input is pressed. This function has to have the following prototype where it receives an input action dot callback context parameter. And then we can simply add it to the event listeners listed in our actions performed field. This says that whenever the input is pressed, it will call the different listeners, and so it will call on jump. Now to check all the inputs are wired up as expected, we can add some debugs in our script. At that point, if you run the game, you'll see that you get various debugs in the console. So we've successfully instantiated and referenced our input actions. But now we need to create our physics-based movement logic. This logic will use a rigid body component 
on our player, so I'll add it first. And I'll also add a collider on the hero object to get collisions with the ground, the walls and the cubes. Note that in the rigid body, I'm going to freeze the X and Z rotations, because I don't want the ball to roll around and lose its up direction. Indeed, I'm soon gonna need to check for the distance between the feet of my player and the ground, so I need to make sure it's always straight up. Okay, now back in our script, we can now get this rigid body component in our awake function, and keep a reference to it in our class, and then set its velocity in the fixed update method. To do this, I'm just going to define a new speed variable in my class with an arbitrary move speed for my player, and then I'll use my move dear value to update the x and z components of my rigid body velocity. If you run the game again, you'll see that you can now move the red sphere with the left stick or the WESD or arrow keys. For the jump action, we're gonna say that when we press the jump binding and we trigger its on-jump callback, we're gonna add some vertical force to the rigid body. Again here, I'll define this force as an arbitrary private variable in my class, just for the sake of simplicity. And now I can simply replace the logic in the onJump callback function to have it add a force on the rigid body along the y-axis in impulse mode based on this value. However, even if it's a simple prototype, I don't want the player to perform double or infinite jumps. So I'd like this to only happen if the player is currently grounded. To check for this, I'll add a little empty game object at the feet of my player called groundcheck and then I'll reference it in my hero controller and I'll assign it in the inspector. Now in my fixed update, I can use the position of this object and do a little raycast downwards. If this raycast does hit the ground, then it means the hero is grounded and that it can jump in our onjump callback. Else, it's currently midair and the onjump function should simply ignore our input. To make sure our raycast only checks for collisions with the ground, it can be a good idea to use Unity's system of layers, to filter out the other objects and limit the search. So let's create a new tag in our project, ground, and give it to our ground object. For good measure, you should probably also give this tag to the cubes in the scene, so that the player can use them as platforms and jump off them too. Then back in the script, we're gonna declare a layer mask variable for the ground layer, set it up in the awake with the built-in layermask.getMask function, and finally add it as the last parameter in the physics raycast call in the fixed update. This will optimize the raycast process and ensure it only checks for hits on objects within this ground layer. So now, if you restart the game, you see that the player is able to jump and slide around. We can move in the scene as we want, jump if we are grounded, and the engine physics just continuously applies gravity to bring us back down, so we can do another loop around. Now, I'll admit that here we haven't actually used our look dear and look actions. I've shown you how to set those up, but I don't want to spend too much time on this, cause it's mostly about computing some angles and stuff like that. So if you're curious about how to have the camera rotate around the player, you should definitely check out either the GitHub repo with this additional code, or the written article where I also detail this additional logic. But anyway, there you go. You've now got a basic example of how to install Unity's new input system in your project, how to define input actions, and how to cut up a basic physics-based player controller that handles cross-platform inputs. I hope you enjoyed this quick tutorial and that you learned a few things to using Unity's new input system. If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And of course, if you have other ideas of Unity tricks that you'd like to learn, Go ahead and leave a little comment down below. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.